That's good. You can tell what he's been doing with his time, amen? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Turn to the book of Acts chapter 13 this morning, please. And verse number 22. Acts chapter 13. And verse number 22. Book of Acts, the Apostle, chapter number 13, verse 22. When he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And Father, I pray now that you'd add your blessing to the going forth of your word. Our Heavenly Father, that you'd anoint this messenger. And bless it to the hearing of the folks who hear this now. They receive it as it is, the Word of God, not the Word of men, but the Word of God. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. The Scripture says, quoting 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, that David, that God sought out and found a man after his own heart. Now, of course, if you've read the story of of uh, Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba, it almost it almost shocks you to think that how in the world could a man after God's own heart do such a thing as he did? But let's look at some of the things that we read about David. These are some of the things that are characteristic of David. This is a manifestation of his character. In 1 Samuel chapter number 16 and verse 18, Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, a man of war, and prudent in matters, a comely person, and the Lord is with him. David was a mighty, valiant man, brave and skillful in warfare. No doubt. No doubt. Because what he did before Goliath was, was no doubt, no doubt, something that he had thought out and that God had told him to do, and then God used it to bring the giant down because of his choice of weapons, because the manner of his death, it showed the hand of God in the defeat of Goliath at the hand of this shepherd boy. But make no mistake, David understood the nature of the battle. He understood the nature of his enemy, and he understood how to confront him. And this, my friend, is a great characteristic. It is an advantage for anyone to understand your enemy to understand the nature of your enemy, and to understand the warfare that is necessary to bring him down. One of the things the Bible says is casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. The Bible says that the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God for the bringing down of strongholds. The Scripture says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In the arena of the spirit warfare, you must be equipped spiritually to deal with a spiritual foe. Satan is not defeated with swords and guns. They have no effect on him. Satan is a spirit being. Therefore, you must know what to do when you come face to face with your enemy, the devil. So David understood this because Goliath is a type of the Antichrist, a spirit being. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 17 and verse number 20, notice this about David in his heart. The Bible said, David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took and went as Jesse commanded him, came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight, and shouted for the battle. Notice carefully that David was still concerned, even though he was going into battle, he was concerned about the sheep. This was the heart of a shepherd. Now think about this. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has a heart for the sheep. I'm one of them. And I know that the battle rages. And I understand what they call the fog of war. And if you do any reading or watch any documentaries, you'll understand that there comes a time in battle when things are not clear. You're not even sure where your enemy is. You may be firing down upon your own people. What they call friendly fire. So... 
This spiritual battle that we go into is something that we need to be equipped for and we need to understand that there is a sheepfold where God takes care of His sheep. Amen. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verse 29, we read these words. 1 Samuel 17, 29. We understand here what he says. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 29. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? David understood what the big picture was about. You can get lost in the forest. You can even get lost on the battlefield. You can have one unit fighting here, another unit fighting there, and not coordinating their fight, and they're working against each other. But David understood what the greater picture was about. He understood the cause. There is a cause. There's a reason for us to meet in this house. There's a reason for the preacher to get up and preach the Word of God. There's a reason that we teach our people from the Scripture. There's a reason that we try to maintain a testimony before a lost and dying world about the one that we believe in. Yes, there is a cause. And let me tell you what that cause is. That cause is not Preacher Lawson. That cause is not the Baptist. That cause is our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. That His holy name can be exalted before mankind. For for men desperately need the Lord Jesus Christ and what He can give to them. Amen. And today every kind of a Christ in the world is being preached. So he understood what the cause was about. In 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verse number 45, he wanted the world to know who the true and living God was. Notice what he said. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. Oh, that we'd understand that. If we could just realize today, it is not me fighting against the devil. I'm not fighting against the enemy or the spirit battles of this world. He is the captain of my salvation. The battle is the Lord's, not me. I am simply here as a messenger for God to place here, place there, do whatever He wants to with me. That's His business. The battle is in the hands of God. He will choose the tactic. He will choose the place of battle. He will choose the time of battle. And make no mistake about it, He will win. Amen. So the Bible tells us here that He wanted them to know who the true God was. Dagon, Baal, Ashtoreth, Milcom, and all the other pagan gods were going to be judged. If you remember, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egyptian bondage, they'd been there for 400 years. He told, he told Moses and he told Aaron, he said, I will judge the gods of the Egyptians. You see, friend, if we could just see the battle that rages in this auditorium right now, Right above your head, where spirit beings are locked in combat. If we only understood that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual uh, principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. If we only understood that the battle is a spiritual battle that rages. You don't defeat Satan in the flesh. You defeat him on your knees. You defeat him with the Bible open. You defeat him when you meditate in the Scripture. You defeat him when you turn your heart and your soul over to God and say, Lord, You're my God, You're my Lord, and not the God of this world. And then when you give Him your life, He'll give you life that you didn't even know existed. You will live a life that is far above anything that this world is seeking for. They scratch, they claw, they kill each other, they buy, they sell to try to live. And they're dying all the time. So the Bible tells us here that He told them who the true God was. In 1 Samuel chapter number 23, this is a remarkable thing. 1 Samuel chapter number 23 and verse number 1. The Scripture says, Then, in 1 Samuel chapter number 23 and verses 1 through 4, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. 
Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. David understood that before he went into battle, there was a time when he needed to get a hold of God. So his character was, he sought out the Lord. Now here we have a prime example of the Urim and the Thummim. What is that, preacher? In the Old Testament, you could go to the priest, and you could inquire of God through the priest, and the Lord would answer through that priest. If you remember when God had turned his back on Saul, because Saul had turned his back on God, that Saul inquired of the priest. He went to them in questions, and he got no answer. This is why Saul sought out the witch of Endor. Because he couldn't get a communication from the priest, he went to the occult world and went to the witch of Endor. And she was going to raise up an impersonating demon, a familiar spirit that would instruct Saul as to what was going to happen in the battle. Here, my friend, when David went to the priest, the Bible said that he communicated to David the will of God through the Urim and through the Thummim. You might want to go home this afternoon and type that into your computer. And you'll be surprised, my dear friend, nobody really knows what the Urim and the Thummim was. The two words mean lights and perfections. But we still do not understand fully what that communication was. But we do know this. God spoke to His people through the priesthood. The priesthood was the anointing. The priest had been anointing. And they'd been set aside and consecrated unto the Lord God. This is why the sin of Saul, when he had the priest of Nob killed, was so heinous. Because he had Dueg the Edomite. His own men wouldn't do it. His own men, when he commanded them to fall upon the priest, because he said, you've been hiding David, and you've conspired against me. And he had his own men to fall upon them. And they said, no, we're not going to fall on the priest of God. We're not about to touch them. And so Dueg the Edomite. Do you know what an Edomite is? He's the son of Edom. Esau, the one who sold his birthright for a bowl of pottage. Dueg the Edomite fell on them and slew the priest of God that day. He had no respect for the anointing of the Lord. He had no respect for the office of priesthood. He did not know the difference between the holy and the profane. And so my dear friend, David did. And when David went before the priest, God answered him through the Urim and through the Thummim. You can go today. You can go to the Lord. And you can get an answer to your prayer. Amen. Amen. You don't find out a man that has the epod. You don't look for a man that has the mitre. You don't look for one that has the epaulets on his shoulder. Who do you look for, preacher? You look for that high priest that is seated at the right hand of the Father that has direct access to the throne of Almighty God. And you can hear from the Lord. Now, you may not hear at that moment. You may not hear what you want to hear. But God will answer you if you understand the anointing and you know the Lord. And you cry out to Him as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He will answer your prayer. Amen. So the Bible says that He went and He got an answer from the Lord. But don't you notice what it says in 1 Samuel chapter number 26 and verse number 10. In 1 Samuel chapter number 26 and verse 10. This is a remarkable statement that goes with what I just said. And they said to David... Verse uh, his 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 his, uh, his generals, you've got Saul at your hand. You can smite him to the ground, and the one that has been driving you all over the countryside. They said to David, we can kill him and eliminate him, and the threat will be over. But here's what David said in verse number ten. David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die. Or he shall descend into battle and perish. Watch verse number 11. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. What do you mean, preacher? What did he mean by that? Was not Saul, the king of Israel, a murderer? Did he not kill the priest of Nob? Did he, not, did, he not, did he not slay anyone that got in his way? Why, he was a madman. Yes, David said all of these things may be true. But there was a time when Samuel the prophet took a horn of oil 
And he poured it over the head of Saul. And he anointed him as the king of Israel. So what does that mean, preacher? That means that Saul was consecrated to the office of the king to serve the Lord. The anointing means that wherever that oil touched, that it was set aside for God. It belonged to the Lord. It was consecrated unto God. And therefore, you don't cross that boundary. Let God take care of that business. That's what He'll do. But you are respecting the anointing of God. The Bible says that you have an anointing that the world knows nothing about. You don't need their books. You don't need their gurus. You don't need their teachers. You don't need their help. You don't need anything they have. You've got the Bible and the Holy Ghost. If you'll take that Bible and open it up and get on your knees and let God fill you with His Spirit, that anointing that they know nothing of will begin to open up the Bible to you. You may not understand all the technicalities involved. There may be much in the Scripture that you can't just take in all of a sudden, but you can take the Spirit of the Bible in. You can take the fact that it's the Word of God you hold in your hands. You can take that in because of the anointing that's upon it. This book is anointed. This book is consecrated to God. This book is the Word of the living God. This preacher that stands before you this morning, that opens up this Bible and preaches, I must have to, I have to say this to you. God has called me and He has anointed me to preach His Word. What does that mean, preacher? It means this. It means that I no longer can take sides. It means that I can't pick and choose who goes to heaven and who doesn't. It means that wherever some soul needs a man of God to come and pray with them and preach to them, it's my duty and my responsibility to go. Are you following me this morning? That's what a man of God is supposed to do. Amen. You don't walk into the house of God and come in. The preacher gets up in the pulpit and gets up and says, I'm a Republican preacher. No, my dear friend, you need to get out of the pulpit. You don't walk into a church and the preacher gets up and says, I'm a Democrat preacher. Oh, no, no, no. Get out. you got no business in the pulpit. You get up in there and open up God's Word and you say, I am God's preacher. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're an Independent or a Whig. I will minister the Word of God to your soul. That's what that means. Consecrated not to a political party, but to God Almighty Himself. David understood that. He understood that Saul, the king of Israel, even though he was sorry and low down, he was still God's king. For God had anointed him. Now I know that the kingdom had already been prophesied to go to David. I understand that David had been anointed at Hebron. I understand that David, that God said, I'm going to take it from him and give it to you. But even though God had said all of that, David still had to endure persecution. He still had to live as a fugitive. He still had to be out here in the field while, while Saul was on the throne. Why? Because Saul was the anointed of God. And David also understood what that anointing was, for he had been anointed too. Are you listening? So there's a preacher out here and he goes astray. So there's, there's a preacher out here and he's a man of God. And my friend, make no mistake about it, it's happening all the time. He's a man of God and he's been anointed. And he goes astray. It's not my job to go out here and drag him down and take him out of the ministry. I'll leave that to God. And leave it to him we will. Because if the Almighty wants to bring you down today, you'll never see another sunrise. If the Almighty says, this is it, dear friend, your days are up, your days are up. Don't play with Him. Don't mess with Him. You're not messing with a man like us. Don't lie to Him. Don't try to hide from Him. He knows every breath you breathe. He knows the beating of your heart. He knows your soul. He knows us like a book. Don't you think for a minute that you can get away with Him like you can with a human being. The anointing of the Lord is something God gives and He doesn't take away. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I know some preachers out there right now and they're running from God. 
I know some preachers out, now, out there right now and they're hiding. I know some preachers out there right now that are making excuses. And I know that they brought shame and reproach upon the name of the Lord. I understand that. But it is not my place to judge them. I leave that to the Almighty. But I can warn them. You better get right with Him if you belong to Him. If you know Him, He knows you. He will chasten you. He will bring you back. He knows His own. And if He doesn't bring you back, He'll put you in the grave. Sure as you live, preacher. You stood up and preached His Word. Don't know what happened to you. I don't know why I'm saying this, but somebody's listening. You were a man of God at one time. You ministered the Word. You helped people. You were there for them 24-7. And something happened to you. You've laid your Bible down. You're running from God. I beg you in the name of Jesus, come back to Him. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Come back to Him. And you'll be surprised. He'll meet you. And He'll bring you back in. Hallelujah. And so it is, Christian. Same message for you that is for the preacher. If you're running from Him today, where are you going to run to? How far can you run? How fast can you run? Where can you go to get away from the Lord? Wouldn't it be so much easier just to get up out of your seat right now while I'm preaching? won't bother me. I just come down here and say, Lord, I'm quit. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the battle every day. I'm tired of making excuses. I'm tired of this. I want to come home, Lord. And you'll, you'll see the doors swing open wide. And He'll bring you home. Hallelujah to God. He'll bring you home. So, He understood the spiritual anointing. He rewarded Jonathan's friendship by honoring his son, 2 Samuel 9, with Mephibosheth. He gave generously to God's work by buying the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. He understood, even though, Je even though Aruna, the Jebusite, even though the Jebusites had no idea of the significance of Mount Moriah because they didn't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though all of this is true, David bought that land because that's where the temple of God was going to be built and that's where Isaac was offered as a sacrifice unto God. That's where Abraham took Isaac, folks, was to the top of Moriah and that's where Arun of the Jebusites' threshing floor was located and David bought it so they could build a temple. David was a spiritual man. You know, it seems like that the more spiritual you are and the closer you get to God, the more Satan draws close to you. And then he puts you into an arena where he wants to pull you down. He wants to destroy you. And then laugh in the face of God. Like he did to Job. He said, God doth know. God doth know. Here's what he said to the Lord. He said, you built a hedge about him. And you know that if you take that hedge down and let me into it, he'll curse you and die. That's what Satan said. What he didn't understand was that God knows us better than Satan knows us. Amen. But here tonight, this morning, this is what I want to talk about. Because this is the part I believe that is after God's own heart. Second Samuel chapter number 12 and verse number 13. Second Samuel 12, 13. This is when Nathan, the prophet, came to David confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba and the ultimate murder of Uriah. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. David admitted that he had sinned. He confessed it. He said, I have sinned. Then in Psalm chapter number 51, David said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the loving kindness of According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David said, I repent. I repent. Let me say something to you this morning. Please hear me. That's the most wonderful day in your life. Is the day repentance comes into your soul. Some of you are so hard in your sin. So hard. You shut God out. 
So God's not going to tell me how to live. Nobody's going to tell me. It's a hard in it. You can't repent. I was watching a documentary a couple of days ago. You know who the Mennonites, the Amish, Hutterites, Baptists, Anabaptists, you know all, you know a little bit about that. You know that back in the time of the Reformation, the Anabaptists were the rebaptizers. That's what it means, rebaptized. They rejected infant baptism. And so from them came what's called the the Mennonites, the Menno Simons, and then from the Mennonites came the Amish, Jacob Amman. Also the Baptists came, the Baptists were there with that group, the Hutterites, a lot of other separatist groups. A lot of the Mennonites moved into Canada, started a community up there in Canada. But back in the 1800s, because of some problems, many of them moved out of Canada and they moved down to Mexico. And they started their own community in Mexico. Now we're talking about Mennonites. A lot of these Mennonites drive buggies with horses that pull them. They, you, think, you think you're looking at an Amish. But a lot of them are Mennonites. They wear handmade dresses. They wear big bonnets and uh, very colorful. And, you know, for the most part, I'd say mo for the most part, the Mennonite community, they're good people. I'm, I'm sure for the most part they love the Lord. This is no, this is no indictment of Mennonites, but I'm going to tell you something that is a fact. Some of the Mennonites down there in Mexico, one man in particular, they made balls of cheese, wheels of cheese. He hollowed the wheel of cheese out and he put marijuana in there. Put it in a sofa, put it in his car, his truck, and drove it out of Mexico into the United States and up into Canada. They had no problem getting through the border guards because when the border guards saw a Mennonite pull up, they thought, could not go on through. They never for a moment thought that a Mennonite could have anything to do with drug running. But they did. They were running drugs. Well, eventually, they came to the border, and these dogs that can smell, dear friend, had been trained to smell out dope. They came to this car, and all of a sudden, this dog went wild. And so the border patrol that was with the dog looked closer into the car, a truck, whatever it was, and the dog led them straight to the sofa that had the dope. And they pulled it out and ripped it open, and there's all this $250,000 worth of marijuana in the trunk of a Mennonite. And they're shocked. They're amazed. How could this happen? How in the world could a Mennonite be running dope, but the truth of the matter is, he was. And not only had he been running dope, he had gotten his two sons into it, he had gotten some of the women in the community, and as a little group down there in Mexico, they were running dope into, into the States and into Canada. Well, to make a long story short, they still went to church, they still wore their handmade dresses, they still wore their bonnets, they had the colorful clothes and all of that. Still drove their buggies with their horses. In other words, everything continued on. They were faithful to church. But they were running dope. So what's the point, preacher? The point is simply this. In their mind, they were still Mennonites. In their mind, they considered themselves to be Christians. Although they, in their heart, had long since departed from God. They were living a double life. That is one of the great deceptions of sin. Sin can mess you up so bad that up here in your mind you can remember all the great Christian things you've done, said, believed, and what you think you are. But in your heart you're so far from God that it's not funny. It's far, far from the Lord. And my dear friend, repentance it's when the heart of that Mennonite dope runner starts to open up and starts to understand it's not the buggy with the horse that matters. It's not the handmade dresses that matter. It's not the colorful bonnets that matter. It's my heart and my relationship with God that matters. That is the prelude to repentance. When that man or woman or whoever they might be gets on their knees and says, Lord, ain't nothing I can put on.
wear, drive, walk behind, live in that has anything to do with my relationship with you. It's what's in my heart and in my soul. God, forgive me. Forgive me for running dope. Forgive me for the situation I'm, for the kind of life I'm living. God, have mercy on my soul. That's repentance. Now today they're telling people that repentance is not part of the gospel. They're telling people that you don't repent because repentance is a work. Over here in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. I want you to read something with me. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now watch this. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. What's this? That you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. What's it say in your Bible? To salvation. Did you get that? The apostle made it as clear as he possibly could. That true biblical Holy Ghost sent repentance leads to salvation. Amen. It's not a work. It's a change of your heart. Amen. That's what we need today. Oh my, do we need that today. We need that work that changes the heart. You can hide behind your religion. And this is not condemning Mennonites. As I said a moment ago, no doubt a lot of good Mennonites that love the Lord, Amish, and the rest of them. It's not about that. It's about the absolute, pure, rank hypocrisy where they put on all the religious garb and their heart is as dirty as it can possibly be. That's the issue. And that's the issue with you and then with me. When I was in Charleston, South Carolina two or three years ago, we were driving down the road. And this little dog walked out from the side of the road. I'll never forget this. And the family saw it too. Little dog, just a little old thing, about this big. It just walked right out across the road. You know how you dodge this and dodge that? It just walked right across the road. Both lanes coming this way and both lanes going that way, full of traffic, bumper to bumper. You can imagine what happened next. That little old dog walked, walked right under the wheels of one of those cars. It was rolled up and killed it right there on the road. But that dog had one thing on its mind where it was going. It had no concept of the danger that was all around it. And it was just going blindly toward that spot. Didn't make it. The little dog never had got about midways of that road. And there that little body lay. It's a dead dog. Run over by a car. That's the way a lot of people are living. Just like that. They have no concept of the danger that's around them. And what can tear you all to pieces and destroy your life. Some of you are dabbling and playing around with stuff that you wouldn't touch 10 years ago. Some of you are watching stuff on television right now that you know you don't need to be watching. Some of you are going to places you know you don't need to be going to. Some of you are reading stuff you know you don't need to be reading. Some of you are running with a crowd right now. You know you don't belong with that crowd. It's called sin. S-I-N. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Not me, preacher. Yes, you. The biggest fool that ever walked the face of this earth is the person who thinks that you alone can do what you're doing and get away with it. And the rest of these peons out here are going to get caught and they're going to pay and you're going to be okay. No, you're not. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And David knew it. David knew it. This is why in Psalm 51 he pleaded for two things right off the bat. He said, Lord, have mercy on me according to thy loving kindness. That Hebrew word translated loving kindness there and in Jeremiah 9 and other places literally means grace. Grace. Lord, have mercy upon me according to your grace. I plead mercy because of grace. I got nothing to offer, Lord. I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough for it. And by the grace of God, Lord, by your grace, by your grace, have mercy on me. Have mercy. David was pleading for two things. He was smart. He was wise. He understood spiritual concepts. He said, I want mercy. 
Can you give it to me by grace? I don't deserve it, Lord. I killed Uriah and I took his wife. I don't deserve it. But I know you. Remember what Jonah said? You remember what Jonah said to the Lord? God gave him a command to go to, to Nineveh and preach. He said, go to Nineveh. Preach to those people. What did Jonah do? He went in the opposite direction. Got him a ticket to Tarshish. The way he went. Well, to cut to the point. Here's what Jonah said to the Lord. He said, Lord, I told you. Because I know you. And I told you that if I go in there and preach to them, that they're going to get right with God and you're going to forgive them. Now, isn't that exactly what happened? Now, I'm paraphrasing him, but that's what he said to the Lord. That's what he said. He said, I know you. He said, they don't, nerd, they don't deserve to be forgiven. They're our enemies. And yet I know you. If I go in there and preach to them and they repent, you're going to forgive them and I'm going to be mad about it. <laughs> and he got mad. Jonah, after it happened, went out and sat down and a gourd grew up over his head, gave him a little shade, and then the wind came along and killed the gourd. And Jonah had pity over the gourd, but didn't have pity over people who didn't know their right hand from their left hand. Well, let me say that to you this morning. You might be mad at so-and-so and such-and-such and having-having -such and -and -and whatever. They might have crossed you, done you wrong, talked about you like a dog. They might have stolen from you and robbed you, taken your husband or your wife away from you. But I'm going to tell you something, and it might make you mad. If they get right with God, God will forgive them. <laughs> now, you might get so mad you can't stand it and stomp around and blow for the rest of your life because your enemy got forgiven. But that's the Lord. You remember what I told you about being anointed? The consecration? God doesn't see your skin color. He doesn't see where you came from. He doesn't care how much money you got in the bank. He doesn't care how much you know, how much you've been blown up by everybody, how great you are. That doesn't mean a thing to Him. He's a gracious, long-suffering, merciful God. And He, when He went to the cross, tasted death for every man. That includes your vilest enemy. If He will confess and repent, He'll forgive him. Amen. That means you. If you'll confess and repent, He'll forgive you. I used a word this morning that you don't hear any. Sin. That's not positive, that's negative. People are so used to hearing, you're beautiful, or you're wonderful. I just get goosebumps when I get around you, you're so great. Or you're the most wonderful thing in the world. I just go home and spend the rest of the day just being giddy all day long. Oh, I was around so and so. <laughs> Wasn't that wonderful? Ha <laughs> ha! Man! I was around a real Christian celebrity. And you get fed that stuff week in and week out, week in and week out. Amen. You get fed it <laughs> ad nauseum. The truth of the matter is, you ain't beautiful. You're not wonderful. You're not great. God got along fine before you ever showed up. He's going to get along fine when you're gone. He doesn't need you. You need Him. And when He went to the cross and died, He died for your sins. And he died for the greatest sin, that's the sin of unbelief. And if you'll come to him this morning and repent, he'll forgive you and cleanse you and write your name in the Lamb's book of life. Would you do it? Father, in thy name we pray, Lord. In Jesus' sweet holy name. They need to forget me, Father. I'm just the messenger. And they need to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and exalt and lift up his high and holy name. Father, in thy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning, brother.